Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast presented by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Be sure and check them out at BlueWaterClimateControl.com or give them a buzz at 865-299-2290. You can give them a call and you can get an appointment online. However you wish to do that, they will come and take care of any repair need that you have, any tune-up that you need. Don't forget, they're in the middle of their winter-only promotion, which is that ductless single-zone mini split system that's perfect for any small room, bonus room, sunroom, whatever you have in your house. That's a little bit uncomfortable. It's a perfect system for heating and cooling, um, and it's a great deal going on right now. For more details on that deal, give them a call or check them out online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com. With Austin Price and Rob Lewis and Brent Hubs, obviously a lot to get to going on, guys. Um, Tennessee's University side issues a statement on uh, Monday afternoon regarding where things stand with this investigation. Uh, make it very to me, they made it pretty clear it was still ongoing. Things were taking place, and they confirmed what we had in the war room on Friday, and that's that they're using outside counsel. I think the outside counsel stuff is probably being um, uh, made out to be a little bit more than what it is. I think that's commonplace and gets it happens a lot. Um, around the country. I think it's happened at Tennessee multiple times. It's happened at other schools around the conference multiple times and not in not every case did somebody lose their job or anything like that. So I, I don't think that that's as big of a deal as, as anybody makes it out. I think the bottom line is based on the statement that was given Monday, this thing stands where we thought it's stood for well over a week now. And that Jeremy Pruitt is, you know, what happens to Jeremy Pruitt hinges on what comes out of this investigation. What we don't know is when there's, what the timeline is for anything to be done in this investigation. But Austin, it feels like it needs to be sooner rather than later when you look at where things stand right now with transfers, trying to hire staff, and obviously players hey. returning to your campus. Now, now, I'm sure the campus side would say, well, we're until we're done investigating, there's not any decision gonna be made and we're gonna continue to investigate. But I don't think they're doing themselves any, you know, I think they're doing themselves a huge disservice. I think they're doing Jeremy a dis, the fans a disservice, all the coaches on his staff a disservice. I mean, you look at, you know, just kind of everything that, that, you know, kind of matriculates. You got players that, you know, aren't sure, you know, whether to come back to campus for a late semester start, you know, because, you know, they don't want to play for anybody but Jeremy Pruitt. You got, you know, potential transfers that, you know, don't want to come here without any kind of clear direction, you know, and that's not to say that they wouldn't, you know, want to come here otherwise, but I mean, like, if you don't know who the coach is going to be or who the position coaches are going to be, that's kind of hard in my mind. So like, you know, I think, that, you know, the way this thing all is shaping up, it just is, is setting up for, you know, a, a really tough outcome one way or the other, you know, whether he's back or not, because if, if he's not back, then obviously, you're entering into a coaching search and or just a transition of power, how it depend on how quickly they do it. And, you know, if he is back, then you've squandered several key days where kids could potentially, you know, take a hard look at Tennessee in that transfer portal. And, and you know, let's face it. I mean, if I was a kid and I was at an ex school and you saw, you know, Tennessee's got an opportunity there, but I don't know who I'd be playing for. I mean, are you really making that move? I mean, that, that's that's a question I think all the time. I almost think the coaching hire issue is the biggest. I mean, I don't don't discount the transfer issue at all. But I mean, you know, guys like you know, like T Martin and, and Neither My Here, there's guys around the country that have expiring deals that as a, as season's end, they're gonna be sitting down and you know, talking about, you know, either either they re up with their place or, or they move on and, and look at openings. And right now, I mean, Jeremy's got his hands tied behind his back if you're gonna keep him. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of those coaches, Brent, have been through stuff like this before. So, like, I don't think they're going to get super rattled. But at the same time, they want clarity because, you know, if they need to find another job, they want to be able to have the chance to move on and have real options. And for the guys that Jeremy wants to potentially bring in, they're sitting there going, bird in the hand, I maybe like the Tennessee job better, but, you know, bird in the hand over here with this job, you know, it, it, again, I, you look at the broad scope of this thing, I think it touches a lot of different areas. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, it, it, it is encompassing on a lot of different fronts, and you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, a couple of clarification things. Austin, you mentioned this. This is something I've heard. 
Jeremy, we know Jeremy Pruitt's talking to potential candidates out there for uh, positions he has on his staff. Everybody wants to know, well, can he hire somebody? Is he allowed to hire somebody? I don't think he's been told he can't, but at the same time, too, I don't I think, think he's he asked for a contract. He can. He's not been. He's not asking anybody for a contract yet. I don't believe because yeah. I don't think he's at that point where he's ready to hire somebody. I think he certainly believes he can go out and hire somebody whenever he's ready to make a hire uh, with one of his, you know, with one of those position, you know, staff openings. Um, but again, I think some of those potential candidates want to know exactly what's going on and, and what's going to happen, you know, moving forward with, with everything at Tennessee. I did, uh, I have asked follow up from the statement from the chancellor side and the university side for any kind of potential timeline. If they're willing to give any kind of timeline, I'm waiting to hear back on a response from, from that. Um, I'm hoping that we'll get that sometime today on, on Tuesday uh, as well. So uh, we'll see. That was a follow up to that state, to the statement that I received. I asked that as a follow up. We'll see if they answer that in any way, shape, or form. So um, you know, kind of the waiting game goes there. And Austin, that's affecting what the transfer market kind of looks like for Tennessee because you, you had you know, the, the, the Crone kid. Well, Jack Cone comes off the board. Yeah. So we're, yeah, I mean, we're, Jack Cone know, comes off the board. Go ahead. And I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that he liked Tennessee. I spoke to him a couple of nights ago, um, you know, but I think that he was, you know, clearly, you know, wanting some type of clear direction as to who would be coaching him. And I mean, you know that Notre Dame is, is you know, they may have movement on their staff, but then you're not going to have movement from the top, which would cause a trickle down effect. So, um, you know, I, I think he was much more comfortable there. And, and it's something about maybe even him wanting to play lacrosse there as well. That's something true. about lacrosse. There was some type of lacrosse angle with him and Notre Dame. Okay. And, you know, I mean, nobody expects Brian Kelly to go anywhere. His name has surfaced, Rob, for a couple of NFL jobs. And, you know, who knows if it surfaces there again. I think it is going to be interesting to see what college coaches become involved in NFL positions, both as head coaches and position coaches, because we're seeing that um, we're, we're seeing that effect. And, of course, Monday was – yesterday was Black Monday in the NFL with, what, six firings that took place with, with head coaches. So – um, that's always a possibility with a trickle down effect for, for coaches around the country as well. Now, the, the one thing too here, Rob, is, is, is I think, you know, you see this and, you know, basketball kids move around all the time. Football kids now all of a sudden have the opportunity move, to move around more frequently. Now we'll see if the SEC adopts the interconference transfers, but either way, like if you're like a guy like Quavaris Crouch and you're getting a phone call from Sam Howell every day and, and, you know, I mean, like Notre Dame's there playing in the orange bowl you're not really not sure what's going on here. I mean, again, these kids are going to start to listen to stuff. I'm not saying all these kids are going to mass exodus because I don't think that that necessarily would play out, but I do think that there's a possibility of that. And when you factor in that, like, you know, these kids, you know, they, they're impressionable. They're 19, 20, 21 years old, and, and they just want to win. So, like, I, ultimately, I think that, you know, all these kids at least entertain leaving or they are leaving until they're not. Yeah, I mean, I'm – I mean, I'm, I'm with you, AP. I'm not suggesting Tennessee is going to have 15 guys leave. But, I mean, you open yourself up to that with, you know, with the, the uncertainty that you created with this linear investigation and combined with the one-time transfer rule. That's an opportunity they don't, you know, that's, that's not been there before. And, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, all the, all the doubt or the lack, of, the lack of clarity would make some kids think about that more than they otherwise would. And I just, you know, this, this goes back to – my guy NYC Vols post in the chat. If this was LSU, man, this thing would have been wrapped up two weeks ago. You know, it, it's 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 interesting too about the you're talking about Crouch and some of those things as well. One thing I don't know that a lot of people understand out there is how closely intertwined college athletes are to each other. You, you know what I mean? Because I mean, the the world's I mean, with social media, with kids seeing each other at camps. With, with kids being on visits with each other, with the way that they communicate now with cell phones and, and with text Snapchat. messages and Snapchats and all this other stuff. Online gaming. There, there, there's a recruiting process that really never ends. I mean, you, you used to like if, if, say, let's use Crouch and Sam Howe as an example, right? Those two are from Charlotte. They know each other. Well, years and years past, Rob, when, when one guy went to one school and one guy get to the other, they might see each other at Christmas break for a minute you know, and, and catch up then. But that's really the only conversation that took place. These guys talk to each other all the time now. 
And so there's always a little bit of an ongoing recruiting thing that's going on. It's really going to go on now with the one-time transfer rule. And that's not to say that Tennessee's Harrison Bailey's not had conversations with Eric Gilbert, right? I mean, that, that's, that's commonplace, but, but those things happen more frequently than I think a lot of fans oh, realize and a lot of fans. To- know. Totally. You know? And, uh, and also a, you know, it's illegal for a, a coach to make contact with a you know, kid at another school, but what's to stop, you know, what's to stop him from the, you know, the, the tight ends coach or the running backs coach and a lot of back linebackers coach, you know, asking, you know, Sam Howell, for example, Hey, what's, what's up with so-and-so you talked to him on social media lately, let him know this, this, or, this, or this. you call the high school coach. Yeah. I mean, you know, and so I think there's a lot of conversations and a lot of stuff that goes on and takes place, which is why ultimately for Tennessee clarity sooner rather than later on all fronts seems to make the, what, the most sense that what Tennessee needs. So we'll see. I just keep going back to Brent and and Rob, the, you know, the timing of all these changes, the timing of the changes when they fired Butch at the end of 17, which was the first year of the one of the early signing period. You know, you look at all the coaches that were hired that year, really the only one that's really kind of had a lot of success is Mullen. And then all of a sudden he's gotten sideways down there with some people and, and maybe looking to get out and go to the NFL or whatever. But I mean, like you look at all the other guys, they're either fired or on the hot seat. Um, and, and, and you don't think that that matters? Because I do. I mean, like, I, I get it. Like, you know, now, you know, if you make a move, there's always the early signing period. But I think teams are a little more prepared for that now than they were in 2017 when they fired Butch and, and Jeremy and them, you know, you know, basically had 10 days or so to, to fill a class. Um, they had less time than everybody else did because of the way Tennessee's surge went. Yeah, and then now all of a sudden you're looking at fired AD first. <laughs> yeah, I, now you're looking at a potential change, you know, now in the year of the the first year of the one time transfer. I mean, again, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have all these kids leave, but there's the possibility. And if that happens, I just think it sets your program back immensely. I mean, I really do. I mean, I'm not saying that you can't like turn it around with good coaching or whatever, but I, I do think it it would definitely hurt the program. Well, I, I think a rebuild just in general, I, I think a rebuild project in general, right, it, with the one-time transfer rule going into effect, you know, a lot of people think, well, okay, you know, you, you, can, you can flip your roster, you can get your roster going um, in a hurry because you can bring in transfers. I, I think the reality is you probably are going to lose more than you bring in, you know? I, I mean, I, I just think that – I mean, I look at a guy like Shane Beamer, and, I, and look, I – I have no problems with Shane Beamer as a coach. And I think that he can be a successful coach over there, but you better be patient because they're, they're going to play with low scholarship numbers in year one. He's probably not got enough um, clout from an, I mean, I, you know, he's got a famous last name, but he's not been a coordinator. Right. So how many people are going to go, man, I'm going to go play for Shane Beamer at, at South Carolina. Maybe the people that maybe a kid in Oklahoma that leaves, but how many other people really know, you know what I'm saying? It's, I mean, Sarkeesian's a little bit different when you go to Texas because he's gotten so much praise and people know him as a head coach. But for some of these guys, I, I think a rebuild with a one-time transfer deal is just got, is just making rebuilding harder, not easier. Because I don't, I think you're going to lose more than you gain in the transfer world when you come in in that first year. Um, but you know, we'll see how it plays out, but that's certainly what it feels I, like. I honestly wonder, they don't have it in place now, Brent, but don't you think over time, because I think inevitably what you're going to see is, is, you know, how like a high school coach, like, you know, like when, when Ouch, his high school head coach left Harding and went to another school, Crouch could not follow him there. They had a, a rule in place in the state of North Carolina where, you know, your players at one school can't follow you to the next, you know, do, do you think that that ever happens in college? Cause I mean, look, let's say, you know, a job, somebody moves on, but then like decides to take like three players with him and those guys are willing to go, you know, I mean, like, don't, don't you think it's where it gets a little I dicey? Think, I think that's a really good idea. I can, I could totally see a rule coming like that, but we, you think it'd be head coach. It'd be hard to do that with assistance. Wouldn't you think? Cause there's so much movement. Oh yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I think I mean I think it would be. Um, and, and so the assistants, the assistants would be the bigger draw than the head coach in a lot of ways. Oh, I don't. Yeah, I mean a quarterback going to go going to go follow his offensive coordinator somewhere. Yeah, you know, I mean I, I don't I, certainly, but 
Um, knowing the NCAA, it would, they, they would do something in a reactionary deal. And to this point, you've not seen that kind of mass movement. But again, we, we don't know how everybody's going to handle the one-time transfer, right? I mean, you, I mean, you, you don't know because it's opening up a new recruiting season is what it's opening up. Um, and, and what's that window like? I mean, how, how many kids are going to transfer who are in the portal are going to find a home between now and the start of the spring semester? How many of them are going to end up going back to the school they were at and go to class and go through a recruiting process in the spring? Take a visit, go see some places, Rob, and then go make a decision that way. You know, I think some of your big name guys are going to go ahead and make a move. I think quarterbacks are always going to be able to find a home pretty quickly. Some of these other guys, you know, they may go through the process and visit two or three schools before they make a final decision, which brings in a whole nother layer of the recruiting calendar uh, and a whole nother challenge to roster management for coaches. I, I just think it's going to be fascinating on a national scale to see how everybody manages their rosters and how they figure that out going forward. Oh, I think um, it's going to be chaos. Oh, I think it's absolutely going to be chaos. All right, let's turn to hoops right quick and, and talk some hoops here. Uh, we'll, and then we'll get out the door with a little bit of uh, recruiting stuff on 22s because I know, uh, Austin, we got some stuff coming up on the 22 classes. Uh, you've been working the phones and talking to some of those guys in the state of Tennessee. Rob, with this hoops team, look, Saturday against Alabama, we talked about it right after the game in the fast break. I mean, Tennessee was just bad. Um, they were bad on a lot of fronts. Um, not a whole lot looked um, the way it was supposed to look, shot selection, defense, the whole nine yards. What do you expect out of this team tomorrow night as they take on an Arkansas team that presents its own set of challenges? I'll be surprised if Tennessee doesn't bounce back pretty strongly. Now, maybe I'm misreading the situation, but <clears throat> just in talking to people, listening to Rick, and you know, having Rick you know, tell his assistants that this was going to be good for their team, you know, you know maybe some of that – I don't think that's coach speak because I don't think Rick really does that unless he's complimenting opponents. But, uh, you know, I think that it, it helped emphasize some things for some kids and, um, you know, put some backbone into what they're hearing from their head coach. Like I, I wrote the three, two, one, when you're, you know, undefeated and beating people by 28 points a game and you might be in practice and wonder why the old guy is yelling and, you know, why, you know, being so hard on you. But then after you, you know, after a game like that, when Monday rolls around, you, you kind of know where he's coming from, that details matter, that following the scouting report matters. And, you know, practices are, are closed right now because of COVID, but I would bet you that Rick blistered the paint off the walls today and, and will do so tomorrow. And I bet these, I, I bet the guys will, will bounce back. I'll be very surprised if they don't, knowing kind of, you know, having an idea of how he's going to handle practice on Monday and Tuesday. Rob, what do you think is bothering Rick Barnes the most about John Fulkerson? Because I know, look, he set him the last seven minutes in the Alabama game, but he he'd been critical of Fulkerson and the two two or three previous press conferences post game. What's bothering him most about Fulkerson I think right now? His lack of assertiveness. I think that he's on not, both ends or, or offense. I think offense mainly. Okay. I could be I could be wrong about that. And I know Folk, he was bad on defense on Saturday with you know some of the stuff Alabama was doing, but I also think when you know, you're, you're asking him to switch. When you're switching one through five, I, I think you, you're going to put your big guy in, in some tough positions. Uh, you know, Folky moves well enough a lot of times where, you know, he can he can handle that. He, he did not really on Saturday. But I think just not being assertive enough offensively, because I think you saw, I want to say maybe he took three shots in, in the first half on, on Saturday. He finished two of five from the field. But then they came out in the second half. First two possessions, or at least – two really early possessions. I think it was the first two. They came down, they ran some stuff, got him really good looks in the paint. He helped get himself those looks. And then he went and I think made one of four. He got fouled both times. And I think he was one of four on the fouls. And then I think he went into a shell. And if, I don't know if you guys, if you'll remember last year, he did last year against Georgia, at, at Georgia, he took two shots in that game, took two, had two field goal attempts. And Rick just – laid into him publicly with the media. And then after that, you saw him. I mean, he was a different guy the rest of the year. So I'm wondering if, um, you know, kind of the public beat down that, that Rick's been giving him the past few weeks. And, and, and he was – it was – I mean, he was called out Saturday after the game by his head coach in, in a big-time way. By the way, I mean, I, the only guy I think that Rick has ever been that harsh about was Robert Hubbs a few years ago when, uh, you know, he really went in on him. So 
And I, I think, and I think that's because Rick thinks Fulky can be really good, and that he's just nowhere close to the standard that Rick has for him right now. What what's Tennessee's answer moving forward to teams that play the, the five out? Because look, I, I don't want to be the panic guy that they can't beat one of those types team type of teams, but and there's not a ton of those around, particularly in the SEC, that play the way Alabama plays. Um, but when you get into the tournament, a lot of times, Rob, when you see upsets, it's one of those smaller schools that they do play that way. They don't have a big head, you know, they don't have a big guy in the post, so they're going to spread everybody out, try to play small and drive and kick and, and, and shoot threes, a lot of what Alabama wants to do. As a learning experience for this team moving forward, what is Tennessee's answer to that type of offensive well, system? I mean, the easiest answer is for Fulky to go out and be, you know, seven of 11 and, and get, you know, get to the line and go to seven of eight there and, and score 23 points against a little team. When he's, if he's not producing like that, I think the answer is easy. You put, you put Eves at the five, put Josiah at the four, and I think you could play with anybody that wants to play that, that style. So you don't think that style is necessarily that big of a problem. That was just a night where Pons was in, in foul trouble, Fulkerson didn't play very well. Tennessee just had a really bad night at the office. And Alabama hit eight of 11 from three in the second half. I mean, you're not, I mean, some of that was bad defense, but even, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's an outlier. You're not going to see that very often for a team to, you know, shoot it like that, make five in a row at one point. That means, again, certainly – some of those were, were just great looks because of bad defense. I thought, I thought Tennessee really overhelped a lot and left themselves open. But I think that overhelping was kind of a result of how badly they were getting beat off the dribble. So guys yeah. felt like they needed to, yeah. you know, guys felt like they needed to give that help. And, they, and it was just, they, they kind of fed off each other. But I'm, I mean, Rick played this, played that way a little bit the other night. And it was mostly after he got just, <clears throat> excuse me completely fed up with Fulkerson and pinched him. But that's the first time we've seen it this year. I think the, the Ponds, James, you know, and then, you know, three other guards. And I'm, I don't, you can't, you can't play Eve five against everybody, but yeah, I think you can do it against a lot of people. And certainly if somebody wants to go small. On you. So as Tennessee goes and looks to bounce back th this week against um, Arkansas, uh, and, and, you know, sits, settled back in. Again, no panic. It's one loss. They're not going to run the table uh, in the SEC. They're not going to run the table this season. Uh, does, does he need more out of a SCOVI? Does he need less out of a SCOVI? Is he trying to do too much there? S same for Victor Bailey. Is, is this just a situation where those just, just had a bad night? I mean, I think they had a bad night. I think guys are – I mean, you know, let's not forget, normally by this time – and I'm not making excuses. I mean, that Saturday was terrible. I mean, it's right. the worst. I mean, considering the talent, it's it's one of the worst games that I've seen Tennessee play since Rick's been here. And ironically, the other one would be a few years ago when Grant and Admiral Metbunch played Alabama in Tuscaloosa and got you know just beat like a drum. The year you know the year when they won the conference. But um, <clears throat> I think if if you Tennessee should have had played what fourteen games by now, twelve you know. It's not – I mean, I think guys are still figuring out how to coexist with each other. You know, Bailey's a new piece of the puzzle. Keon, Jaden are new pieces of the puzzle. I mean, and big pieces of the puzzle, very talented pieces of the puzzle. And I think they're, they're learning how to – kind of help each other. I also think oh, that Fulton is kind of – you know, realizes that he's playing with a lot of other good players. And I think that's one – I think that's another reason for maybe his lack of assertion. And that's just my opinion. Nobody's told me that, but I wonder – if he if didn't look around, I mean, it's not like last year when it was either pretty much him or Jordan Bowden who was going to have to you know, carry the load offensively. There's a lot of guys. And I wonder if Fulky isn't just kind of, you know, being a little afraid to be the lead dog when he walks into the gym and, and sees how good everybody else is, you know. But this coming, I just, I, I mean, I've, I've said this before about Bailey. I'm, I wonder about his shot selection. He's the only guy on the team that I think is prone to – you know, hunt his shot a little much. I'm not saying he's a ball hog. I'm not saying that at all. But he's – like, I, I think his mentality is score first. And I think, you know, Springer's like that to a degree, but he's really kept it in check this year. And Viscovi, you know, for me, I, I think Rick really likes him. So he's going to have to – I mean, Rick's going to play him because he loves so many things about what he does. And you know, he's, he's unique and, the, you know, nobody's exactly like him on the team. And Rick is going to want him out there, so he's I mean, he's got to he's got to tighten things up. 
He, he does. And, but I, I think, that, you know, the one thing I love most about him is the fact that he does not have a conscience. He doesn't have a memory. Like if he turns it over, like it doesn't affect him, he continues to play the way he plays. Now we had Jimmy Dykes on the nation Sunday night, Rob, he brought up a good point about just, you know, Tennessee, the biggest thing is, is for him, who they got to find who's going to take the shot at the end of games. If, if it's close and, and, and you know, I, I know that they might want to run through, through some things through Fulkerson, but it just feels like that's going to be two freshmen to me. One, because Springer, I think, is, is that good. But then two, Keon the other night, I love the way he backed down there, backed him down a few times and just went and got his points. And I mean, he's, like, he's going to jump over anybody and get that shot off of the paint, the 10 footer. I, I mean, that, 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 to me, that the other night was like, okay, you know, that, that, that's something like you can build upon. I just, I, I don't think, re, I don't think it's going to be the freshman. I mean, they might be the ones that end up taking the shot, but it will be because Fulkerson got the ball, the defense reacted, and, and he made a play to one of them. We'll see. I, I don't know exactly. I mean, Fulkerson's got to get going, obviously. Um, and, and we'll see, you know, as time progresses exactly, you know, what the, what the true identity kind of this team develops and, and morphs into. I mean, you know, and it, and it changes from, from time to time. Um, you know, guys have good nights. Guys have a hot night. You might ride that guy, and you might go through something with him. One night it's different, or a matchup's better. But um, I, I do think if if Springer can stay healthy and and Keon Johnson can stay healthy, I, I think their offensive output, as you would agree, Rob, is, is only going to grow and, and only going to create more problems for for more teams. This this team didn't handle playing poorly very well the other night. I mean, as poorly as they played, Alabama gave them a chance to get back in it, right, at, you know, in the last five to seven minutes. And they didn't have the – they couldn't make the plays to get back in it. They didn't yeah. look like they handled being in that situation very well. And I think that's where Rick's talking about the learning experience of losing. Like, to, and, and, and I think a lot of that is experience. I mean, new guy – I mean, just – like Grant and Admiral and that – they would have won that game on Saturday. Even after Alabama went up by 14 – once Tennessee, I mean, Tennessee cut it to seven plenty of time. Left. Yeah, and had ball in hand at, at a seven-point lead multiple times. Several times. Cut it to six at one And point. had ball in hand. If I mean, if, if the Grant, Admiral, Jordan Bone team had, had been in that situation, I would have bet one of my fingers that they were going to win. And this team just has – I mean, they just haven't – they've not been together all. They don't know how to, how to overcome adversity like that. I mean, and, and that was apparent. And one thing I think this team did – I think they let their let the offensive struggles affect their defense a little bit, and Rick's and that's something that that you know the Grant Admiral squad was, was fantastic at at not letting it happen to them. All right, let's talk a little uh, Tennessee football recruiting here. Of course, Tennessee plays Arkansas basketball on Wednesday night. We'll have full coverage of that. Coach Barnes meeting the media later this afternoon. We'll have coverage of that as well. Austin, you've been talking. We've written about the twenty two class. We've talked about how important that it is. We know Jeremy Pruitt's been working this class and talking to a lot of people. You and Eric Kane have been working the phones really hard the last 48 hours or so to catch up with some of these guys and, and get a feel. What, what do you think is the impression um, right now with the 22s in state regarding Tennessee after talking to well, those I think, guys? I think they're taking a wait-and-see approach. You know, I mean, I, I think that, you know, there, there's a lot of interest in Tennessee from those kids. But, I, you know, they, they see what's out there on Twitter. They see what's up message boards. They see – you know, all that stuff that's out there. And, and, and then, you know, they see, you know, articles, you know, they're getting written on, you know, on Monday, you know, because I had a couple of them text me. Off. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, they, they see all that stuff that's out there. And, and so like they have major questions about it. So, you know, again, the, to get back to what we talked about to begin with, the quicker that Tennessee can come to some resolution one way or the other on this deal, the better for everybody involved, including the class of 2022, which again, Tennessee, I think, continues to be positioned well with, but at the same time, you know, the, I don't think they just want to, you know, be flying blind. And and all those guys have had recent conversations with with Coach Pruitt, right? Yes, I mean, he's he worked has. the Coach, he's worked he, the phones worked, hard, right? He has he has worked extremely hard. So, um, you know, and, and you know, I, I think that just getting kids on the phone right now for that class of twenty twenty two makes a world of difference when you can, you know, sit down and talk to them. You know, I talked to the Wade twins uh, on Monday. All those guys, you know, you know, that I talked to Dallin, the Wade twins, Jordan James, you know, all complimentary. But the Wade twins specifically talked about just kind of 
how down to earth Coach Pruitt was, um, and getting you know more some more time with him, uh, you know, and being able to you know just kind of pick his brain and, and understand where he's coming from and get kind of his vision for you know what you know a program looks like with them in it at Tennessee, and so that's kind of where that is. Well, certainly it's a priority for Tennessee. It's been a priority for Jeremy Pruitt, and and it's creating some some buzz across the state with how hard Tennessee has worked at the last. A uh, week or so on the recruiting front in the class of 22. We have full coverage of that coming up in the coming days at VolQuest as well. That's going to do it for this edition of the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast. Don't forget their January special ongoing right now uh, with those split units. You want to find out all the details of that, go to BlueWaterClimateControl.com or you can give them a buzz as well. Talk to Jeremy and his fine staff there. They'll take care of you, whatever you need. Call them at 865 865- 299-2290. For Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody.